Jackson Hole area, and then ultimately, you know, so it's just this huge trip uh, through the area of the West. So I'm going to just show you the end of Jedediah Smith and what's going to happen. Um, he, was, his final major act was coming out of St. Louis on his way and trying to make a way towards um, Santa Fe, New Mexico. So he becomes part of the attempts to establish a trail that beca ultimately became known as the Santa Fe Trail. Now he is scouting ahead of the main body of the individuals, and of course we don't know. We know we, we have all the circumstantial evidence of what happens. You know, no one saw what was going to happen, but he was an advanced you know scout over in front of a crew that was beginning to try to find a way for this trail. And when they came upon Jedediah Smith, uh, they found his body on the ground, and he was the body was riddled by eleven Comanche lances, so you know eleven spears stuck into the guy's body. Now you guys all know that that is essentially kill overkill, right? It's overkill in a very serious way. So clearly the Comanches were trying to make a statement, and the statement was, do not venture into our realm, or this is what's going to happen to you. So the extraordinarily adventurous life of Jedediah Smith came to an end, and you know, I'm not exactly sure where the location was. I've heard maybe Texas or something like, you know, on the way, on, heading towards New Mexico, but on the plains, of, the southern plains of America, it came, uh, the, it came to a, the end of the adventure life of Jedediah Smith who often is perceived as being an essential pathfinder, you know, opening the door to the West, you know, finding routes to the West, of course, many, many Americans would follow him. So critical factor, of course, ultimately in the uh, extension of the American frontier. Now, I want to tell you about another frontier that's, I have to tell you, this is the least interesting of all of them. So this is a little bit problematic, I have to tell you, but it's important to know. So this is called the land speculation frontier. Dr. Hein will present to us the land speculation frontier. This is based upon the, the nature of that land ordinance that I told you about. And I told you guys that they created you know, this sort of survey system that had the baselines and the meridians that became townships that were divided into sections that would be sold to the public. And I told you that it was only a dollar an acre, but they would only sell, the, the, sell it by the section. So the minimum purchase price was $640. So it created a system that sort of favored wealth. Those that had enough money to buy this land could buy it, and they could speculate on it. That means that they would buy it and they would sort of develop it in their own way and, of course, sell it to someone else at a much higher price. And this became just a, a powerful dynamic of westward expansion. All through this period, there are always, you know, one step ahead of the settlers, there are speculators who are out there looking at the land and, and buying the land from the federal government and beginning to subdivide the land. And they were like the essential developers of that time, although they wouldn't build houses. You know, people are expected to build their own houses. But they would, you know, subdivide the area, of course. They would create manage or the size lot that people would want. They often did do provide ser some services. They would make roads into their area. They would sometimes lay out a place that could become a town or something like that. They would build schools. It's a classic thing for a developer to do to build a school to attract the people to come, you know. But their objective, overwhelming, was to make money, of course. They're going to bring settlers into their area, and they are indeed, of course, going to sell the land to them. I do want you to know that very prominent Americans were involved in land speculation, including George Washington. George Washington speculated on over 5,000 acres of Ohio. This was a big part of his potential wealth. And, you know, he struggled with it a little bit. He had to kind of, you know, have squatters and get the squatters off. But you know, this was the way that he was going to generate significant wealth for himself. So, you know, it wasn't just anybody that was doing this. Even George Washington was a land speculator. Perhaps the most famous land speculator, though, ultimately, was a man by the name of Daniel Boone. And I'm just being a little Western here with you guys. I was doing Daniel Boone. And by the way, I did these on the computer. That's why they look the way they are. Anyway, I'm uh, just trying to take a little bit of the burden off my wife. Daniel Boone. When I was a kid, uh, there was a TV show, Daniel Boone. By the way, uh, Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone were kind of, you know, TV figures in my youth. And, of course, the Daniel Boone uh, show had a, a theme song. Daniel Boone was a man, was a big man. With an eye like an eagle and as strong as a mountain was he. Of course, I remember that from my youth. But anyway, Daniel Boone will lead, he leads really the first group of Americans over the Appalachian Mountains. So through the Cumberland Gap, the Cumberland Gap was a, a pass on your way heading from really Virginia into Kentucky. And he led them through there. There's a famous picture of him doing this. And um, it's kind of like Daniel, it's a painting. Daniel Boone leading the people through the Cumberland Gap in, in the face of the rising sun. And of course, the problem with that is that, you know, he's go they're going west and it would have to be the setting sun. But, you know, I, the suggestion, of course, of the newness of the settlement of the west or something like that. But, you know, the question is, why did he do that? Why did he lead them through the Cumberland Gap into what you and I would call Kentucky? And the reason was because he had 10,000 acres that he was speculating on. He created his own little town there called Boonesboro, and he's trying to bring the people in to, to buy the land. 
And he will spend much of the rest of his life and career kind of doing this, always staying ahead of settlement a little bit and, you know, speculating on land until he finally moved all the way out to St. Louis, Missouri. I think he d ultimately did die in St. Louis, Missouri. So uh, Daniel Boone becomes, you know, he's another one of these expressions of the, of the land speculation. Just a little s dumb story. I hope you guys don't mind if I tell you. But when I was a little kid, uh, the first thing I, I remember ever really wanting for Christmas was a, da a, a David Crockett coonskin cap, you know. So quite, at that time, Daniel Boone was wearing a coonskin cap on TV. David Crockett was wearing a coonskin cap on TV. And, I, and as a five-year-old, I just really, really wanted one. So I remember that Christmas morning, and I was so excited to get a coonskin cap, you know. And we'd go into the living room where my mom and dad would put all the Santa Claus and all the gifts, and we'd open them up, and there was no coonskin cap. And I, I have to tell you, I was very, very disappointed. But my mom gave me this kind of weird little nod, you know, don't worry, don't worry, we're going to work this thing out. And I, I had no idea what she was talking about. But somewhat later in the day, um, my aunt's in-laws came over. So this is my Aunt Pat and her, her husband's parents. And, you know, no significant relation there whatsoever. Their name was Paige, and the one thing I do remember about them, that he was a fairly wealthy, well-to-do businessman in, con in construction. And indeed, he was part of the building of the Matterhorn at Disneyland. That's all I remember, you know. This was the guy who helped build the, the Matterhorn, so I thought that was a really big deal. Well, Mrs. Page came over, and my mom was super excited, Mrs. Page were super excited, and they sat me down, special kind of, and they gave me this big present. I think it was like a big round box. And they said, here's something for you. My mom just had this kind of smile beaming. So I opened it up, and I pulled out what I guess Mrs. Page thought was like a coonskin cap. What she had done was she had taken one of her mink stoles. This, this woman had mink stoles. And she had sewn it together more or less in the shape of a, a coonskin cap. I remember it was kind of, it was weird. It was a little too tall. It, the tail was a little too long. Of course, it was the color of mink. I'm pretty sure that he, it had a silk lining inside of it. It was really, in some ways, you look at that, that was a beautiful thing. But here I'm a five-year-old kid, and I know exactly what the, the Daniel Boone, the appropriate, you know, uh, coonskin cap looks like, and this isn't it. And I, I'm pretty sure I turned up my nose almost immediately. And when I did this, my mom got really serious, and she said, you better be, you know, that kind of, you better be grateful. And of course, I was very thankful, and I put it on my head to make sure that they all felt great. But as soon as the pages were gone, I took that hot hat off. You know, I wasn't going to wear that. I thought it looked like a sissy hat. You know, I wasn't going to wear that thing at all. And so the hat, you know, just sat there in my room for a long time, and, you know, I didn't want to wear it. My mom did finally break down and get me more of the official Davy Crockett one, which I'm sure was a really crappy synthetic thing, you know, not, not like this Mick one. Well, my, another uncle came to, to my house one day, and this was my, my aunt's husband on another side, my dad's side. Uh, his name was Owen, and he was this classic uh, cla uh, practical joker guy. He, just, he, just would, he couldn't, couldn't live through life without you know, trying to make something funny happen one way or the other. And I'll never forget like one of his classic, really problematic practical jokes. My cousin was graduating from college, and so the party was their house. And my uncle had actually got him a Corvette, which is, you know, an older Corvette, but still a nice Corvette. And the Corvette was parked in the neighbor's garage. But the way my uncle decided to, you know, to kind of make that all happen was, we're all in the backyard, we're all just enjoying the party. And I don't know if it was somebody, but someone runs into the, to the backyard and says, you know, so-and-so next door has cut his hand in the table saw. Like, some terrible thing has happened, you know? And I remember just like this panic kind of goes through the place and everyone is running down there. We go through the backyard, go out into the street, go into the, you know, the driveway. And my cousin was Jeff and Jeff throws open the garage and just, you know, horrible. Well, he's just scared to death. And all of a sudden, all that's there, of course, is this Corvette, which his dad has given to him. But Jeff was so angry at his father for scaring him so much that he just turned around and kind of like flipped him off and then went back. You know, I think I walked up to my uncle. I was probably about you know, six years old. Oh, I like the Corvette, uncle. You know. Anyway, this is the kind of thing my uncle would do. He just, he loved to do the practical joke and often would take advantage of my mom, who he saw as very gullible, uh, to do his practical jokes. Well, he's over at our house and he sees my coonskin cap and he says, can I have it? And of course, I'm not going to say you can't have that cap. You know, sure, you, if you want it. So he took my coonskin cap this mink coonskin cap, and he built a cage for it. And the cage had like an enclosed area and then an open area. And the, in the enclosed area, there was like a little doorway kind of, you know, classic little uh, cage. And what he would do is, you know, he'd rig this whole thing. He, he had the hat inside the enclosed area. He had the tail kind of just dragging out into the open area so you could see it. And he came up with some weird name, you know, this is my so-and-so animal. And what he would have people do is they would open the cage up. And when they did, that hat was spring-loaded to just fly. The fur would just fly up in your face. 
Now, he was nice enough not to do it to me. He just wanted to show me what he did. Chris, look what I did with your hat, you know. And, of course, for everyone else, he'd have them, you know, I have to, you know, scared to death as the fur flies up in their house. So, if nothing else, my coonskin cap had a very, uh, very um, interesting career. And just to finish this little section, I want you to know that we have no evidence whatsoever that Daniel Boone ever wore a coonskin cap. So, that may just be the total creation of Hollywood in the contemporary period. But anyway, um, you know, these land speculators are part of the process, and they proceed then, of course, you know, those who will follow, especially the settlers that will, that will follow them. Now, that will lead me to my next frontier, which we simply call the settlement frontier. And, you know, I hope you have a classic image of the settlement frontier. Uh, I always have one in my hand. It's right in a little house on the prairie. You got Ma, you got Pa, you got Mary, Laura, and baby Carrie. You got Brindle Bulldog Jack, of course. You got the oxen pulling the wagon, the covered, classic covered wagon with the arch, of course, and the canvas over that. You know, they're, they're pulling a milk cow behind them as in the horses. They're kind of going as they make their way out to the little house on the prairie. And I want you to know that the image is not wrong. This is exactly what we see. Here's Gus back to play with me again. Um, the image is exactly kind of what's going on as far as settlement is concerned. And, you know, so we have these settlers moving on to the frontier in their wagons. There was the classic Conestoga wagon, which was a monster wagon, a little too big really for most of the, it's more of a freight wagon, and then a smaller kind of wagon, you know, a little more lightweight that they would use. The thing I always think about when the, they were doing, moving these uh, west, these um, covered wagons, was sometimes, you know, crossing the rivers could be scary as you can imagine, and there were actually times where they would float the wagon, you know, they're, they're out there and the, the oxen lose footing, of course, and you would drift across the ford, and you can imagine the potential panic, and I wonder how many times the wagon simply just co collapsed. You know, many of them were sealed enough, they were watertight, kind of act like a little awkward boat as they made their way across. But, you know, so the settlers are going to follow the land speculators. They, they can't buy the land directly from the government, but they can buy it from the land speculators, and we do see the settlers begin to make their way across the country, of course in areas where there were woods chopping down the trees to make their farms and their log cabins and all, and further out, of course, you know, having to make do with whatever the resources were there. Now, the settlement frontier is a component, of course, of westward expansion, but there's a kind of special quality. This is the way that um, Dr. Heim would focus upon it, there's a sort of special quality. So the story is that there were times uh, when these settlers go far beyond the boundaries of America into extra American areas, and simply by moving into these areas and settling these areas, they are going to become, Gus is messing up with my hand, they're going to become um, you know, proponents of the expansion of the American frontier and actually the boundaries of America. So there's actually, these are where like the settlers become the agents of expansion. You know, they're not going into American areas, they're going beyond them. There are essentially three stories in the story of the settlement frontier. And the first and major story of this is the story of Texas. Tejas fue el frontero del norte de Nueva España y más tarde los Estados Unidos de México. So what I've just told you, and it only took me 35 minutes to put that all together, was that Texas was originally the northern frontier of Nueva España, New Spain, and then ultimately Mexico. So this was actually part of the, of course, of the, of the uh, Spanish and Mexican held. So here is Tejas or Texas Forest. Now, what happened was that in 1821, Mexico becomes independent of Spain. Spain had really been damaged by the whole in, in, uh, Napoleonic period, unable to continually continue to hold on to its empire, and, and bit by bit, of course, all of it's pretty much going to fall apart uh, during this period. Anyway, when Mexico took over, and of course they take over a fairly substantial area all the way down to Central America, all the way up to North, uh, Alta California, including the area what we would call Nevada, uh, Utah, of course Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas, all those areas were part of the, uh, the Mexican area. The Mexicans were concerned that the area was vulnerable, you know, and we all know that this is not a paranoid concern. You have to kind of worry about the Americans who are so aggressive and so expansionist. So in 1821, Mexico made a policy to try to shore up control over Texas and the northern frontier. And the way they did this was that they would offer very inexpensive land to anyone who would go settle there. So if you moved to Texas, you could purchase the land for 10 cents an acre. And 10 cents an acre basically is simply a transactional cost. You know? That's just the cost to do the paperwork. It's not a market value. It's a transactional cost. So they simply made it super cheap to go to Texas with the hope, of course, that Mexicans will go into the area. Now, I, you know, I'm not sure this was a mistake. But, I mean, it seems like it ultimately is one. But they didn't say there were no limitations on who could go to take advantage of this. Ultimately, if you did go there, you had to become a Mexican citizen at least, of course. You know? But they didn't say that anyone, they didn't restrict anyone from going to the area. And so the interesting thing was, of course, that the people who are going to settle in Texas, uh, much more than Mexicans, were Americans. The, 
the, the gringos are going to come. They saw an extraordinary value, land value, of course. Uh, Texas really is an extension of what we call the, the um, cotton frontier, the cotton area. So, you know, East Texas is pretty much the same as it is in Louisiana, Mississippi. It's, it's a good cotton producing area. So for those who wanted to expand onto very cheap lands, of course, this became an incredible attraction. And the Americans, as soon as they hear about the cheap lands in Texas, of course, are willing uh, to be, are, are wanting to go there. The very first Americans who, to come to uh, Texas were led by a man by the name of Stephen Austin. Now, actually, the man who thought about what was going to happen here was his father, Moses Austin. And wouldn't it be interesting if it was Moses who led them, of course, into this area, Moses into the Promised Land. But Moses died before anything could happen, so his son Stephen Austin, and I mention this primarily because Austin, of course, becomes the name of the capital of Texas, will lead the first significant group of, of Americans into Texas. They are known collectively as the Old 300. They call them the Old 300. But leave it to the Texans to exaggerate everything because the reality was there were only 297 of them, you know. And the Texans love to exaggerate just about everything, all right? But Stephen Austin will lead the Old 300. They will purchase as a group over 200,000 acres. Remember how cheap it is, over 200,000 acres just to the north of San Antonio, and they became the, the initial American settlers. But of course, they're just the beginning of what will become kind of a wave of settlers. And by the time we get to 1836, we're looking at about 35,000 Americans who are living in Texas. You know, here come the gringos in a very serious way because they, you know, this was a huge economic bargain. Um, bargain for them, you know, getting cheap lands and, of course, being able to do the things they wanted on the land. Anyway, when they came to Texas, there were certain things they had to do. They had to become a Mexican citizen, so, and they were willing to do this, you know, on, you, you want to call it a nominal kind of change, so in name, name they will begin to call themselves Mexicans. And by the way, to be a Mexican citizen, you had to be a Roman Catholic, so it's kind of like a two-step process, conversion to Roman Catholicism, and then, of course, application for citizenship. The, the image we have, of course, of the Texans becoming Catholics is they find a drunk Irish priest to, to take them through the, you know, the whole kind of issues of how you become a Catholic, and pay them a little money, buy them some whiskey, and of course, all of a sudden, they're a Catholic. Uh, so they were nominally Catholic, so that meant in name they were Catholic, though in, routine, in reality, of course, largely Protestant, and no, in nominally Mexican, so in name they were Mexicans, but with no real intent to, to really make the, that the reality for themselves. Anyway, you know, they begin, they're going to come in here, and they're increasingly going to kind of take over the area. And inc increasingly we're going to call this particular group, of course, not Americans, we're going to call them Texans. The Texans begin to see themselves as this distinct element. Now, they never really wanted to be under Mexican rule. I mean, that's, that's the essential reality. And so what they kind of just waited for things to kick into gear where they could begin to, you know, complain about the situation. And fairly soon, by the time we get to, let's say, 1836, the early part of 1836, they're complaining about a lot. They're complaining that Mexico doesn't support them, that Mexico doesn't help with the roads, that Mexico doesn't help with the schools. And one real problem was that Mexico did not allow for slavery. But in this particular case, they, they kind of winked, blinked on this one, you know. The, the, the Texans are bringing slaves into, uh, excuse me, the Americans are bringing slaves into Texas. So the Mexicans had to deal with it, and so they called them contracted labor, and of course, contracted for life, you know. But there was always this kind of problems that the Mexico really didn't like the slavery component to it. So many of the Texans were unhappy about that particular issue. So finally, the Texans decide that they've had enough, and they're going to seek their separation from Mexico. Now, they, and they rise up in rebellion in 1836. Now, of course, you, if you remember, the whole objective of Mexico was to gain control over Texas, not to lose it. So the Mexicans are not going to go gentle into the, this particular night. Uh, their Presidente General, the Generalissimo Santa Ana, will lead a very substantial contingent of Mexican, uh, the Mexican army to the north, 6,400 men, with the intention, of course, of regaining control over, over Texas as much as they possibly can. And as the Mexican army comes, it will lead to two very famous battles that will take place. The first one occurred in February of 1836, and it occurred in San Antonio, and the Texans found themselves kind of in this very fortress-like mission that was located in San Antonio. And I'm sure you guys know that the name of that mission was, was the Alamo. And 182 uh, Texans were there in the Alamo, highly defensible location, an open area in front of them, of course, and behind them, so that anyone who came at them had to come across open ground, and they were up above in this really sturdy building, basically. And it will lead to this battle in, in uh, at the Alamo in 1836. 
uh, the Mexicans, of course, will suffer greatly. Uh, I think something like 1,600 casualties in ultimately taking the Alamo, which they will do. And in the end, of course, all 182 of those who were in the Alamo will perish in the Alamo. So, and, and you know, became sort of martyrs of this particular cause. Among those who died, uh, James Bowie, the guy of the Bowie knife fame, uh, Davy Crockett, of course, the guy with a whole bunch of stories to tell himself, William Travis, a famous lawyer from Texas, of course, a number of um, number of uh, famous uh, casualties as far as the Alamo is concerned. All that that did, though, really, was rally the rest of the Texans to the cause, you know. So the rallying cry was, remember the Alamo, and let's continue the fight, of course, and let's make this happen. And so that leads to a second very important battle that occurred in March of 1838 at a place called San Jacinto. San Jacinto is about 20 miles out of Houston, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, if you drive Interstate 20 out of Houston, I remember I was on the, on the highway, and I looked off to the south a little bit, and there was an obelisk coming up from the ground, and I think that is the battle site, of the Battle of San Jacinto. And the Texans at San Jacinto were led by this man by the name of Sam Houston, of course, who gave his name ultimately to the largest uh, city of Texas, Houston. But um, in that moment of the battle, they basically catch the army, the Mexican army, kind of in siesta and napping. At least Santa Ana was napping, and a relatively easy victory over the Mexicans, and including the capture of Santa Ana. And what this will allow, of course, now Mexican is in this situation of relative defeat, allows the Texans to proclaim themselves independent, and they will establish themselves as the independent entity of the Texas Republic. The Texans actually do uh, establish themselves. Texas is the only state of the Union that has actually been its own independent state for at least a brief period of time. Uh, so here comes the Lone Star State. Now, Texas did indeed... Um, want to ultimately, I think the Texans generally wanted to become part of the United States of America. There was no immediate annexation of Texas, and you know, a couple important reasons here. One was that diplomatically it would be very problematic, of course, Mexico would be very unhappy if this occurred right away. And indeed, as soon as uh, the United States does annex Texas, it will indeed lead to war. So, I mean, that's, that's a very um, clear understanding of what's going on. The larger issue, though, was more of a, a sectional issue, so it's between the North and the South. And the thing that the Northerners didn't like about Texas was that it was a slave area, okay? So if you admit Texas, that's going to mean there's a big, huge slave state that's going to come into play. And so many Northerners were very much reluctant to, to, to let this happen. Ultimately, though, James Polk is elected president. Uh, he's a Southerner. He's an expansionist, has no qualms whatsoever. And Texas will be annexed by the United States ultimately in 1848. And indeed, this will lead, of course, to war with Mexico. I mean, the, you know, Mexicans were not going to be happy about this situation one way or the other. The cause of the war was that no one really, there wasn't a determined southern boundary. So the United States claims the Rio Grande, and you guys all know that that's the way that's going to work out. But Mexico claimed the Nueces River, which was a little farther to the north. And when Mexican military crosses the Rio Grande into the disputed area, uh, the Americans use this, Polk uses this as a, a you know, pretext for war. We have been invaded by Mexico. You know, very problematic claim in many ways, <clears throat> but enough to convince, you know, enough people in the government to, to declare war. And so the Mexican-American War will commence in 1846. Um, the war will be pretty much a solid victory for the United States of America. Invasions into Mexico proper, including ultimately the take of uh, Mexico City. Um, of course, invasions from the northern part. Uh, the United States will send military forces into the west. Uh, one of the, uh, this is Stephen Carney, Brigadier General, will go first become the conqueror of New Mexico. What he did was he sent a little message ahead to in Santa Fe and he said, we're coming, and if you guys want to play it cool, you can simply surrender, and of course, we'll just we'll, we'll make things go okay for you, and that's the way that that would be managed. Uh, but then he will leave New Mexico and, of course, take his army all the way out to California. Uh, they come into California when things are unsettled, and they will meet with the Californios who are offering some resistance in the south at a place called San Pascual, which isn't too far for some of you people who may live, of course, and just to the east of Escondido there by the wild animal safari. I can't remember what it's called there. Whatever the, the wild animal park is, is called today. Anyway, there at the Battle of San Pedro, a small, but you know, and just momentary. The whole thing lasted, you know, less than about 20 minutes, basically. And actually it was quite the victory for the Californios. The Americans were forced marching across the entire area. Their mules were tired. It was a foggy day. They got strung out in the valley. 
uh, their their powder was wet. You know, it was ineffectual in terms of their guns. The the Californios had fine horses. They were very good horsemen. They used these long seven foot lances that were you know, sharpened and fire hardened. They used their lassos to pull. They would rope the soldiers and yank them off their their horses and then stab down upon them. And ultimately, about 21 American soldiers will die. I think maybe there was one California casualty. The Californios did leave the field, so the Americans will claim victory. Of course, not exactly if you look at it in any kind of objective way. But, you know, it's a Pyrrhic victory. Uh, the Californians are not going to be able to sustain themselves in the face, of course, of the United States Army coming, not even though there weren't that many, and the United States Navy that had already been there, and California will kind of fall to uh, fall to the United States, too. The war will be ended.